Today we're going to talk about One Mind. This is from the Awakening of Faith in Mahayana by Bodhisattva Asvangosha. This is a masterpiece that combined 100 Mahayana sutras into one concise shastra. It talks about our pure mind. In the beginning, he said, May all sentient beings be made to discard all their doubts and to cast aside their evil attachment and to give rise to the correct faith in Mahayana so the lineage of Buddha may not be broken off. He wrote this shastra for this reason. He wants us to get rid of all our doubts about our true nature and to cast away our attachment to this deluded mind so we can have true correct faith in our own Buddha nature. We call it the Mahayana. We will have a brief overview about this shastra in this class. First, let's talk about this shastra as a whole, the one true mind. It has two aspects. One is the aspect of absolute, two is the aspect of the phenomena. This is the suchness, the true mind. This is the life of our mundane that is in samsara. We want to get out of this life and to live in our enlightened mind the true Buddha nature, the suchness. So let's first look at this absolute mind. It has two aspects. One is the nonverbal suchness, two is verbal suchness. The suchness, you cannot describe it. That's why it's nonverbal. But if you really have to describe it, we can describe it in this way. Let's first talk about how it's nonverbal. It transcends all verbalization, description, and conceptualization. It is what it is. That's why it's called suchness. You can say one world of reality and the essence of all phases of existence in their totality. Our one mind is the only world. But we think the physical world we live in is the real world but only the world of the mind is the reality. We call it the one world of reality. It's the essence of all different kinds of existence. The 10 Dharma rounds, there's only one round, the mind of the Buddha, which is our own mind. So all existence in their totality, the whole universe is this mind that cannot be described in words. If we predicate on words, we will call it the verbal suchness. In terms of two aspects, it's truly empty, yet it's truly not empty. Truly empty because this suchness is empty of all existence. Human beings cannot be enlightened because we have two problems. First, we think there is a real self. Two, we think everything in the world is real. That's our attachment to the self and attachment to all dharmas, which means all things. Truly emptiness is describing suchness. It's really empty of self and empty of all things. If we can detach from the self and detach from all worldly things, thinking is real, we can be empty of all dharmas. That is the true nature of the absolute mind. If you want to talk about it in its conventional existence, you will say it is truly non-empty as well. It has conventional existence. It's provincial. We still live in this world. So we still need to see how this mind is endowed with numerous excellent qualities. It is eternal, permanent, immutable, pure, and self-sufficient. You can say it is eternal, it doesn't have rising or ceasing, it lasts forever. Doesn't matter which round you are in, for how many reincarnations you go through. It's permanent because it's not impermanent, like all the conditions arising. Immutable, it's not moved by any life situation. Our true mind is not affected like our emotion by all the life circumstances. 
and it's also pure, never been soiled by any of your human experiences, which means it has no self to begin with. It's self-sufficient. It's always satisfied because innately we are always perfect. We're always pure in our goodness. So know your goodness. You really have this truly not empty suchness. But how come we are not right here all the time right now? We still live a mundane life because we're living in the phenomenon world, which is the samsara. We will talk about what is not enlightenment and what is enlightenment. We have the original enlightenment. Basically, it's the suchness. But our mind becomes agitated. It starts moving. It becomes non-enlightened. We start discriminating with the sense of the self. We become deluded. Then we start learning Buddhism. We think there's a way out of this non-enlightened mind. So we start cultivating. This is called the process of actualization of enlightenment. Finally, at the end, we will reach the final enlightenment. There are four kinds of enlightenment. One is original enlightenment. Two is not enlightenment. Three is process of actualization of enlightenment. Lastly is final enlightenment. Right now, we're using the deluded mind we call it the alaya consciousness. This is the non-enlightened mind. But we actually have an original enlightened mind. And this original enlightened mind, it has two aspects. One is in relation to defiled state. Two is pure essence. In relation to its defiled state, which means we have the ability to overcome all our afflictions and all our defilements because we have purity of wisdom and we actually have super rational functions. Purity of wisdom, that's when we actually have non-conceptual knowledge of all things. We can live without discriminating. Learning Buddhism is to practice insight meditation so we don't discriminate as much. We're awakened, we're aware of what's going on without conceptualization. That is our purity of wisdom. We call it fundamental, non-conceptual knowledge. That's what we want to reach, to live in a state without a lot of conceptualization. That's when the self will be empty. Then we have supra-rational functions. If we are empty of the self, then we will be empty of the Dharma. We'll have the ability to help all other sentient beings to become enlightened because we are naturally endowed with excellent qualities. Every day it will be miraculous. You can help a lot of people in your life. Just be there at the right moment, at the right time, tell people the right Dharma, and they will be enlightened because we have the supernatural power. Only if we have this non-conceptual knowledge. So do not use this thinking mind, but use our true nature to live this life. So the purity of wisdom is called fundamental non-conceptual knowledge. The supra-rational function is called the subsequent non-conceptual knowledge. One is fundamental, one is subsequent. We have both of these innate in us but we need to deal with our afflictions in relation to our defiled states. Then this original enlightenment has its pure essence. It's actually described as a perfect round mirror. We turn the whole alaya consciousness, the deluded mind, into the great perfect round mirror wisdom. Here it has four kinds of mirrors. One is the mirror empty of images. First, we need to understand all the image in the mirror is empty in essence. Everything is truly empty. The mirror is empty of all marks of appearances. Everything appears in your life, there are only images in the mirror. A mirror knows not to be attached to whatever that's happening reflected in the mirror. It stays perfect unmoved by pains and sorrow, happiness and sadness of your life. That is the perfect mirror. 
then is the mirror influencing toward enlightenment. Now it's talking about how it's truly not empty. All of the images in front of the mirror is for us to use. It's not empty because it influences advancing toward enlightenment. You use your life situation to be a bodhisattva and to help others to reach enlightenment. This is truly empty. This is truly not empty. Then we have the third mirror. Mirror free from defiled objects. We use the Dharma and this purity of wisdom. That's why we are free from hindrance both in our afflictions and in our intellect. We should be free from all our defilements of the self and free from our discriminating intellect. This is the mirror that is not tainted in any way. We use the Dharma to renunciate from samsara by changing our non-enlightened state. Lastly, the mirror influencing one to cultivate goodness. So the mirror free from defiled objects, that's our purity of wisdom. The mirror influencing one to cultivate goodness, that's our supra-rational functions. Now, whatever appears in our mirror is helping us and helping everyone to become enlightened, to bring out our capacity for goodness. We are now happily living in this world, cultivating all the goodness and to help all sentient beings. There's actually no hindrances in your mind. All the deluded mind has no validity to be substantiated. The deluded mind never existed in the first place. There's the fourth patriarch of Zen Buddhism. His name is Dao Xing. When he was 14 years old, he visited the third patriarch, Sun Chan. When he arrived, he asked, Master, please teach me the way to liberation. The master said, who is tying you down? He thought about it for a while. Nobody, nothing is tying me down. Then the master said, why do you need a method of liberation? What do you need to liberate from? At that moment, he became fully enlightened at the age of 14. So who is tying you down? Why are you living a suffering life not enlightened? Because we are caught up in our deluded mind, but we don't have to live this way. Now let's look at non-enlightenment. Our non-enlightened state, the deluded mind we're using, it has nine aspects. Three subtle aspects and six crude aspects. The three subtle aspects, that's from our alliance consciousness. The six crude aspect is from our sixth consciousness, our thinking mind. This is the storage. This is the thinking mind. The storage house. The alaya, we will naturally become agitated. It has three aspects. First is the activity of ignorance. The mind is agitated. It becomes ignorant. That's why it's called activity of ignorance. Then it will develop the second aspect, perceiving subject. Then we will have the third aspect, the world of object. Because our mind is agitated, it starts moving. We create a perceiving mind and we create the world of the object. Both the subject and the object are created by your alive consciousness. That's why we said everything is an illusion. It's only created by your deluded mind. The world you see and the mind that is interpreting the world, they're all from your own alaya consciousness. Then we will have the three crude aspects. When we face life situations, we naturally will be defiled. First, we will have a discriminating intellect. For example, someone is yelling at you, insulting you. So your like and dislike will discriminate against the situation. In this case, you dislike someone insulting you. Number two is the aspect of continuity. You will keep thinking about it. 
because this event is giving you pain or pleasure. In this case, it's pain. And you keep thinking about it, you cannot fall asleep, it's really disrupting to your life. The third aspect is the aspect of attachment. Now you're super attached to this dislike. You are very upset. You really dislike the situation. Number four, you will give it aspect of speculation of names and letters. You will assign a label. This person is evil, he's mean, he's my enemy, I hate him. Now he's attached to this name and label. Number five is the aspect of giving rise to karma. You will talk back or you will hit this person, you will give rise to bodily action. Then that becomes karma. Lastly, it's the aspect of suffering. Because you produce karma, you will have related suffering based on your anger, malicious words, or your action. You will have the negative karma. Now you have to suffer the consequences of your mind. So every situation, we think like this. We go through the three subtle aspects and we go through the six crew aspects. That's why we are always non-enlightened. So what do we do now? Is to catch yourself at an earlier stage of the crew aspects or even at the subtle aspects. Catch yourself early when you're attaching names, when you're upset, when you are having negative thought. The sooner you catch it, the sooner you will be out of samsara. Every day you become a little more enlightened. This is everyday practice, everyday cultivation. You want to reduce our non-enlightened, deluded mind and have our purity of wisdom and supra-rational function come out. You have to let go of your deluded thoughts, your false thinking. So the trick is have faith in the Mahayana. How should I live this life? Should I keep living this life in the six crew aspect and the three subtle aspects? Repeat the same pattern of thinking? Or do I want to get out of samsara? I need to change my thinking pattern. I need to have non-conceptual knowledge. Stop discriminating and start living in the true suchness. Bodhisattva Asvangosha explained the absolute aspect and the, the phenomena aspect, they are mutually inclusive. They are one of the same. You cannot be away from the phenomena to see the absolute. And you cannot live in the absolute without the phenomena. So they are mutually the same. We only have one mind that is without any differentiation and it's without any alteration. It is only the existence of the one mind. There was a monk who has been holding precepts for all his life, pure precepts. So one day he was walking on the street at night. All of a sudden he stepped on something, feels like a live frog. He went home and he could not sleep that night because he thought he broke the precept of no killing. In the morning he woke up, he went to the same spot and looked for the frog. And little did he know, wow, it was only a very right eggplant. He realized the world of the object is only created by the mind. Nothing really existed except what is experienced in your own mind. He realized, I have a strong self because I think I am the one holding pure precept. And he has strong attachment to the Dharma because he think holding precept is the most important thing. So he did not understand the empty of the self and empty of all dharma. We need to really awaken our faith in our true suchness. Bodhisattva Asvangosha wrote this shastra is so that all sentient beings would be free from suffering of their deluded mind and to reach ultimate bliss. We can all get out of samsara and reach enlightenment and be aligned with our suchness. 
So samsara or nirvana, you get to choose. So that's the class for today. Thank you for listening. Amitabha.